Ashley. Um, hi everyone, I'm Adrian. I was the FOS lead on this learning initiative and I am super excited to introduce you all to Leander, our wonderful consultant who really did the bulk of this work. Um, we had, when we sent out the call for um, applications to do this Jedi work, we had some really wonderful folks apply and it was a really difficult de decision that Leander won us over um, with his extensive experience working at the intersection of environment and Jedi um, and also with his wonderful personality. So I have no doubt this is going to be a great conversation. Leander, over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction, Adrian. I am going to share my screen and let's get the party started, I guess. Um, one second here. Slideshow from the beginning. There we are. Um, so as Adrian stated, uh, the idea for this project was to really engage and find out how has conservation been approaching JEDI, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in its programming. Um, and so specifically though, how does it relate to the five steps of the conservation standards, the standards for how conservation measure is impacted, uh, is, uh, impact is measured. And so what we've done is I've conducted a series of interviews with various organizations across the globe who have been doing just that. And this is an opportunity to kind of share their stories out and put that into a package way so that practitioners can start to think about approaches that they can consider as they go through each of the steps of the conservation standards about how they can incorporate justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Now, this was a four month project and we were under no illusion that we were going to solve JEDI within conservation programming in that time frame, or that we would hear every single story uh, within that time frame. But this is a starting point and hopefully something that we built off of um, as we move forward. And just a little bit more about me, I am an environmental social scientist. I'm also classically trained as an ecologist. I was a black bear biologist for the state of Florida in the United States um, for two and a half years. And I've done social science projects that run the gamut from uh, dam removal to uh, urban, urban poverty and how um, environmental actions can improve urban poverty. So a whole range of things that I can do um, that I have done and I continue to do through my business at Lacey Consulting Services. So um, just wanted to shout out really quickly to the amazing team, um, the contract team that I had with me, uh, Ashley Baker, Adrian Marvin and Judy Bolshevin. Like, amazing team. I'm so lucky to have been working with the three of them. They really made this project the success that it is today. Um, and really a, another shout out to Ashley, who did a fantastic job in formatting the report for me, um, just made it absolutely stunning. So just want to talk a little bit about what we did. So first thing I did to kind of set the grounding of this, I uh, reviewed nine different programs that were already out there, whether they had been sent me a document for me to review, or maybe I went to their website to find out what they were saying out loud around how they're incorporating JEDI into conservation programming. And that really was to kind of set the stage. Then we went through uh, key informant interviews. Um, we developed qualified characteristics such as that you've been actively engaged in this over the last few years, um, that you have uh, documented your JEDI approach, for instance, and that you can talk to successes and failures around this uh, incorporating JEDI into conservation programming. Uh, of course, we uh, did the topic guide, interview guide, and then we did ended up doing nine interviews over the course of time that we had available. So as you can see, the summary that we've done is a uh, focus on project design and implementation, and they're organized by the different steps of the conservation standards. And that'll be the flow that I go through uh, for this presentation as well, is we'll go through each of the uh, conservation standard uh, stages, and that'll tell you, or the steps, and that'll, sh uh, and I'll highlight how JEDI has been incorporated. So we're gonna start with the assess phase. Um, one thing I'm gonna say first and foremost is that of the organizations that we interviewed, um, assess and planning were um, by far the most responses that we got. Uh, when I started getting into uh, implementation, uh, analyze, uh, adapt and sharing, uh, the number of responses or ability to really share stories in those phases dwindled quite significantly. Um, but there is a lot to say um, in the first two phases. And so let's, let's start there with some of the learning that I got from that. 
So one of the first things that came up came up a lot was uh, leadership and as far as the assessment phase goes. And what they're really trying to say here from the interviews that we've done is that um, it's critical to have leadership on your side in order to you to truly make the changes, systemic changes that you wanna make around justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. You can do it without leadership support, um, but what you find, what we found is that there'd be a, there's, there will be a hodgepodge of successes and failures, and there's no unity around what could be actually done in that space. Another thing for the assess phase is really about engaging the local community and more importantly, the marginalized individuals within those communities. And one of the things that you can do to really think about how can we ensure that our, our organization has um, face time within that community and actually is contributing back in some way. Uh, one way you can do that is in the assess phase, considering hiring contractors that have the expertise that, can, that know how to work with those individuals. Um, that could look like partnering with a human rights or development organization. Uh, it could look like hiring social scientists or economists to be a part of your team to really understand and develop that assessment um, in a way that is founded in expertise, science, whatever the case may be. You may also want to consider in the assess phase having an accountability partner. Uh, this is a maybe another organization or maybe it's a local leader who's going to hold you accountable for ensuring that you are including marginalized voices in your assessment of the um, both the ecological and social assessment of uh, your study area or where your project is going to be. And of course, if you have the ability to, of course, hire local. Um, hire a local person to really be a part of your team to give you that perspective. Um, let them be, you know, it's a give them a, a pay, a paid position, uh, even though it's going to be temporary, but at least it's something that show that we care about your community, we care about certain individuals. And if you can make sure that those individuals that you're paying are from marginalized uh, communities or in groups, that would be a huge help in ensuring equity um, within your assessment of the uh, project area. Continuing in the assess phase, clarifying your scope of work um, is an interesting outcome from these conversations. What, we're, what they were trying to say here is that a lot of times there are gonna be communities throughout the study area, not just within your, within your study area, but outside of your study area, who are gonna want you to do the exact same thing for them. Like, oh, well, you're helping this community. Can you also help us as well? And we would love your help, um, you know, whether it be let's say you're focusing on education, you're focusing on um, providing health benefits so that people have um, the ability to engage with your conservation efforts. What conservation groups have found is that um, they get spread thin very quickly because there's a lot of people who need help. And so being very clear in your scope from the very beginning, it's just gonna make it so much easier for you when you go into areas that really need a lot of assistance to be able to say, you know, unfortunately we would love to help you, but our, our scope is this, and we can't really work outside of that for this grant cycle. Maybe there'll be a future funding opportunity where we can help you and your community. Also, if you are going to focus on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, don't just think about it from the needs of a conservation projects. Somehow connect it to local concerns and needs. Um, make sure that in your assessment that you understand what are the true needs within this community. They're not going to be um, something that you can replicate in every single community. So in one area, it might be about health. And then in another community, it might be about education. Um, so make sure that you tailor your JEDI work to the local needs of that particular area. Also, this is a lot about engaging with marginalized communities. Um, one thing that you can do to be um, more thoughtful in this process is to make sure that you're asking them how they want to be engaged. And it is important to do this so early on in the assess phase because you don't wanna to get to this later on and realize you've kind of missed the boat um, in terms of how you could have engaged with them throughout this entire process. Um, and they may even tell you, um, you know, it's too early, we don't want to engage with you yet, come back to us after you've done your assessment. Or they may say, we want to be there with you, we want to uh, go out and do and show you our community so that you can see what some of these um, ideas look like and not just, you know, the textbook and kind of what we're telling you through documents. 
some of the people that we interviewed also stated, you know, let's be clear that it's going to take a lot of time to build uh, trust and that sometimes you're going to, have to be intentional about your strategies and building that trust with communities. Um, there's a whole literature of social science around um, the building of trust. I've done a lot of work on that. I've given presentations alone on trust building and the science behind it. So there are ways to be more intentional around trust building and just know that it's going to take more time. Also, as you're um, considering your project, uh, really consider a diversity of identities. And this is difficult because um, sometimes we get really caught up on, let's make sure it's a 50-50 of women and men, or let's make sure that um, we have particular socioeconomic groups represented. And I think we limit ourselves in the conservation movement on the type of identities that we can actually engage with. Um, I think there, in here, we could also be getting into things like religion. Uh, we could be getting into things like LGBTQ. We can get into things like uh, ability. There are more things to think about. And I'll talk about the fact of um, kind of the limitations of what conservation groups tend to, uh, the, the identity groups that conservation groups tend to work with. I'll get into that a little bit later. But I just want to say here, just really think, be thoughtful about the diversity of identities that you can engage with. Um, also that if you don't know the community that well, you may not even know how many different identities exist. And so what, what one trap you could fall into is that you might just talk to local government, they'll give you the identities that they think exist, and then you realize that you've missed like five or six or seven, um, just because you don't know the community that well. And then finally, in the assess phase, um, what, and again, there's far more conclusions. I'm just giving you the short version because of the time that we have available today. Um, for the assess phase, um, make sure that you're not just mining sensitive data, meaning that you're not just going to the community and asking them um, questions about, well, can you tell me the history of this marginalized group? Uh, can you tell me some of the past conflicts? Can you give me the information I need to make an accurate assessment? While that is critical data and you absolutely do need that information, um, you need to be giving back to this community as well. Um, you're asking them to dredge up traumatic experiences in order to give you the data that you need to be more effective in working with them. Find a way to give back. And that could mean a multitude of ways. That could mean as you're doing these interviews, you're paying them for their time. It could mean uh, that you say, hey, we wanna have you as part of the decision-making board for this process. There are ways for you to be non-extractive and not just mine sensitive data and put people through traumatic experiences just to help you understand um, the landscape. As part of that, it kind of goes right into this last one, structuring project governance. The idea here is to really make sure that you have folks on your decision-making team, on your assessment team that are really, be, that are representative of the groups that you're working with. Um, it sounds intuitive, but I would just add there's some nuance here, and that is around the idea of making sure that they feel safe to be able to speak up and that they feel that their voices are being heard. So it's one thing to, and I think, I'll, again, I'll talk to, to this later, it's one thing to say we want 50% women and 50% men, right? That's great as a number, um, but it doesn't get to the intangibles, which is, does do the women feel safe speaking up in this um in this group, um, do they have the tools necessary to talk about this project back to their local communities? There's more to it than just saying, we have a number, we have, we reach 50-50, so therefore we've done something. Um, that's just the starting point. Uh, it really is about making sure that this is a safe space and that their decision, decision-making power is equitable. So let's go on into the planning. So as you get into plan, I would say first and foremost, this is again, um, a lot of this is about engagement, stakeholder engagement. So you're talking about stakeholder engagement again in this phase as well, it's pretty heavy. Um, one thing you might wanna consider doing in your planning efforts is to set up a communication plan for how often you're gonna be talking to folks, how transparent your goals and objectives are from beginning to end. 
Um, you may even think about issues, uh, things like your funding sources and making sure that folks have the ability to know who's funding you so that it's not this nebulous, uh, you're not just some nebulous organization with nebulous money um, that people don't think you are, are coming in with some sort of agenda um, that they can't see because you're not giving them enough information. So being transparent is one way to address some of the justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion issues. Um, also consider how you're actually going to take input from marginalized communities. What we've, uh, what folks have, are telling me is that um, this is a space where easily conservation groups can become performative, meaning that uh, you are getting the data because you're getting information and feedback because you have to check a box, but you really have no true intention of addressing any of those issues. Um, if you're going to ask for feedback and you're going to ask folks to uh, really give their time to tell you, here are some things that you could be looking into, here's some local knowledge that you may want to study up on, take the time to actually uh, commit to doing that work um, instead of just asking them for information and then never following through. The, your, what that does is degrades trust and also um, sets up the next organization to come in for failure because now the, the local communities, these marginalized groups who are already oppressed and already feeling as though they're not being heard in their own community are getting it doubly from conservation groups who are also not listening to them and also traumatizing them by not by almost kind of gaslighting them as if they're going to as if you're actually going to follow through with something then you don't so now they have to deal with that trauma once again um, of you not following through and then lastly on the planning phase as you think about um, how you're going to as in preparation for implementation set realistic social goals. Um, you know, don't promise that you're gonna build a school, you know, and don't build a school. Um, but if you wanna promise that you will um, put some a course material together for a teacher, a local teacher, that's fine. Um, you know, as long as you can follow through with that, um, uh, that, that promise. So what we are finding or what has been found through these interviews is that some really, um, provided large promises that they couldn't follow through with. And that led to more distrust and led to, um, you know, again, more issues where people didn't feel like uh, they were in a, a position to really give, give their voice to an organization that they already didn't know to begin with. Um, by setting unrealistic goals, you really do, um, again, set yourself up for failure if you can't follow through. For the implement phase, um, so first thing foremost, um, I want to to kind of state what I've heard throughout the interviews is that individuals have the right to reject your project. I know it doesn't feel great. Um, I know you may think, well, now what do I do? Um, it's time to start planning for that now. Um, that's why in the uh, assess and um, planning phase, it's so important to do the stakeholder engagement, right? Because when you get to this point, you don't want to say, oh, well, I skipped over a stakeholder engagement. Now let's go implement this project. Oh, you don't want the project? Well, our funders want it, so we're gonna do it anyways. Um, you know, that's, that's gonna be a problem uh, for you, even just from getting buy-in from local stakeholders. So really think about this topic that if someone were to reject your project, what do you do? Um, and sometimes rejection means we reject part of it. And so how are you going to amend your project to fit in with the local culture to ensure that you are not forcing your project onto them? One way to do that as well is ensure that you get free prior and informed consent. There's a lot of forms out there. There's a lot of um, documents. In the actual uh, report, there are some links that will give you some resources to make sure that you can get that free prior and informed consent. You also might want to consider during your implementation, creating a memorandum of understanding with these marginalized communities to talk about how you're going to address conflict when it arises, meaning uh, what is the process? Who do they contact? Um, how long maybe will the process take? Uh, what are some potential outcomes of uh, a conflict management process? Be very transparent about your process for how you're going to address conflict so that they can have a clear understanding of what they can do if their rights are being violated. And then uh, lastly on the implement one for now is empower local communities. So what we're saying, what the interviewees were saying here is that when you, what tends to happen is these great projects come in, they do a lot of great work and they kind of um, 
give a boost, whether it be socially to the economy, whatever the case may be. And then the conservation groups leave. And then a couple of things happen. One, um, they, were so they were so dependent and short-term thinking about the economic boon during the time that the conservation group was there that they actually didn't put any foundational structures in place to keep that momentum moving forward. Um, same thing socially, you may, um, through your work, um, elevate certain mar marginalized communities, but then once you're gone, they're still being oppressed and they go right back to where they were before. So all that great work you did to elevate them isn't sustainable because you haven't empowered them for the long term. And lastly, I would say within that space, um, same thing with conservation projects, period. If you're doing a great water project, a good uh, soils project, a good forest project, and it's fantastic at the moment, you leave, you come back in 10 to 50 years and everything is clear cut and the water is degraded even more than it was before you arrived. It's sometimes due to the fact that you didn't empower the community to be sustainable long-term to ensure that those conservation benefits continue on um, after you're gone. So think about empowerment as part of your implementation plan. And then for analyze and adapt, uh, adapt, we'll start with the analyze part. So speak with um, leadership once again to ensure that you have adequate funding for JEDI. This is not um, specific to just JEDI work. I think um, those of us who are in conservation all know analyze and adapt is where the funding starts to fall short and we don't have the ability to follow through with that. Um, but for this being such a critical piece of work that's inclusive, that really it's about um, bringing voices to the table to engage around conservation. And it would be a shame to get them to the table and not be able to carry it all the way through. And so for some folks, it really is about, we need you to address some of the most basic human right issues in order for us to engage with you around conservation. And so this work is critically important and needs to be upheld with funding. So again, speak with leadership. Maybe there's another way for you to think about funding this analyze and adapt part. Um, as you think about how you're gonna get the analysis done, maybe consider um, having a social scientist, environmental economist, or an anthro anthropologist on your team at this stage to really help you um, conduct those analysis. But I would say that if you're going to do that, you would may as well bring them in early on because there, there is data that could have been collected during the assess and um, planning phase that would really help a social scientist out or an economist or an anthropologist to really be more effective in this stage. So maybe don't think about bringing them just here, but have them throughout the entire process. Another part is disaggregate your data. Um, we need to really understand the impact of what you're doing as it relates to individual identity groups, lumping them all into like a region, um, you know, like saying, oh, well, in the, in the Southeast where this project was done, X, Y, Z happened. Okay, great. But let's talk about the individual um, identity groups that are within that region to really understand how each of those identity groups were impacted by your project. Um, it does take a little bit more time, um, not much more time, but it really does help to really understand how marginalized communities are impacted by conservation projects. You may want to do an internal assessment at this point as well. Uh, this is really um, considering who is at your decision making table. Did you do a good job of making sure the right people were at the table? And if not, um, you know, think about your, your, your Jedi impacts, like did you actually elevate and improve the quality of life of certain marginalized communities? Uh, this is a good time to ask yourself that question. And if you, if you haven't, why? Um, or if you haven't, or if it hasn't improved, why not? And if it has improved even, why? Why did it improve? What did you do to improve the quality of life of these individuals to the, so that they can be more engaged with conservation? Um, and also here, maybe as I talked about with funding, uh, I know it can be difficult sometimes, but possibly consider requesting an extension from your donor. If they didn't already include uh, analyzing data as part of your funding, maybe ask if you can get an uh, extension so that you can actually get this work done, or potentially they're willing to provide you with additional money and funding to get this done as well. And then for ADAPT, that means basically you've done the analysis and now you wanna do something about it. So on the ADAPT phase, 
um, look for areas that may have been misunderstood in the assess phase. So in that initial assessment, you may have just missed a few things because you just didn't know much about the community. Through your analysis of your JEDI approaches in the community, now's a good time to say, oh, you know what? We missed a few identities. We didn't engage with a couple of identities that are still marginalized. Um, their voices are not being heard. Let's make sure um, that as we continue this project, we also continue to incorporate those voices into the process. Make sure that you are um, analyzing all the feedback that have that's come to you from marginalized communities. Um, this is a good time for you to say, hey, turns out that while the majority of identity groups that we're working with love what we're doing and love our approaches, for some reason, all the women in the community really don't like the way that we're approaching this. And we need to figure out what's why they're saying that. And so really listen to the data and go back and talk to these uh, individuals to find out what you can be doing better to ensure that they are feeling included and that they have a safe opportunity to engage. And then uh, as stated before, there may be a need, need to engage with new individuals. Again, you may you, that just may pop up from as you learn more about the community, um, you may find out that while before you didn't think there was a large LGBTQ population within this community, turns out there's a much larger one than you thought there was. And so we got to go back and, and really engage with them. And then for the sharing piece, so it's interesting as I did the interviews that the majority of the folks who I interviewed really sharing wasn't a top priority. Um, it was a top priority for sharing within their organization, um, but not sharing outside of their organization. So there's a lot of fantastic work being done around Jedi that most people have no idea is happening because no one's sharing it. And I, I'm going to make an assumption or have an opinion here that one thing about that is that there tends to be a lot of failure in working in Jedi. And Failure is just a stepping stone to success. Uh, failure is absolutely necessary. But when people don't want to share their failures out to everyone, it really holds back the entire conservation movement from being able to effectively engage in Jedi work. So I'll go, that was kind of like my setup here. So for the share, um, ensure that systematic, uh, systemically or systematically oppressed groups have a chance to evaluate all final documents. Uh, this is related to what I talked about earlier about just mining sensitive data and not giving anything back. This is one way that you can give back to the community by making sure that they provide feedback on your final report, that they can say that, oh, you didn't hear us correctly. Like, no, that's not, um, that's not the approaches that we thought you should take. Let them have the opportunity to give feedback, but let them do it at their own pace and language. So if you do have a final report, make sure it's in their language um, that they can understand and interpret. Um, or maybe you need to give a presentation to go through your final report. And you know, hopefully you did uh, hire someone locally and that person can give the presentation. Um, so really it's about having a, a good messenger because you also don't want to go in and give a presentation or give this very technical report that any common person, no matter where they were living, wouldn't be able to understand anyway. It's because it's full of jargon and words that don't make sense unless you're in the conservation uh, uh, field. This is also a good time, um, maybe think about connecting with other environmental organizations. Um, again, there at the end of the uh, report, you'll see a list of the organizations that I interviewed that are already doing this work. Perhaps think about reaching out to them um, at the beginning of your project to say, hey, we're embarking on this endeavor. Um, we really want to ensure that the work that we do here uh, is shared out to the conservation, uh, other conservation organizations. And so you may consider reaching out to one particular organization, or you may consider reaching out to listservs like the Conservation Coaches Network listserv as a way to share your learning. Um, also consider uh, presenting your findings, not just at conservation conferences. Uh, the work that you do is critical to other fields. And so if you're doing work around education and or uh, health, you may consider presenting your findings at these other uh, conferences that also really just bolsters the collaboration that can happen between different sectors. I mean, we need, uh, you know, we need the health sector to help with conservation issues. We need the education sector to help us with conservation issues, um, you know, uh, 
indigenous rights groups, all these different groups need to be incorporated into uh, the work that we're doing with conservation if we're ever gonna be effective long-term. Um, same thing that we need to be more um, willing and open to work with different sectors in order for us to be more effective in the social sphere. Um, and then also make sure you're sharing your successes and failures with your funder to make sure that they have a good understanding of uh, maybe the timeline was too short and they just don't know that because they just think we want conservation group to do more with people. That's great. Um, but let's talk about the actual timeline that it requires to do that. And let's talk about the actual amount of funding it takes to do that. And if funders are not hearing from conservation groups um, any sort of pushback, they're gonna continue doing what they're doing now, which is giving you short timelines to address critical social issues. So just some quick summaries of some of the challenges. Uh, this will be the last slide um, before I talk about what's next. So one thing, the common challenge is that there's a lot of internal shifts that happen in conservation groups, um, kind of like going on to the next shiny thing. And so a lot of the groups talked about uh, the summer of 2020, uh, George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd and the global protests that happened afterwards. And also this is a global shift in uh, prioritize, prioritizing um, uh, BIPOC folks. And while that was great and, I, and it was really appreciated and conservation groups did hear the call and have done some work around that, um, it's too common that uh, you know, the, the following year, there's something else that happens and all of a sudden you, you shift your entire uh, approach and now you're on to the next shiny thing that's going on. And so in order for that to stop from happening is that you need to work with leadership. And this needs to be a part of your core commitment to the work you do, not just relying on a mega event like the summer of 2020 to then all of a sudden start thinking about how might we incorporate JEDI into the work that we're doing. Other, other issue is, as I talked about earlier, reports are not being published um, around the JEDI work that conservation groups are doing. And again, maybe there's a fear of talking about failure and that's why um, reports are not being published, at least not at the pace of the amount of work that actually is being done versus the reports that are published out there. Race, ability, and LGBTQ continue to be overlooked by conservation groups. Um, instead, conservation groups tend to want to focus on cisgender women, indigenous, and socioeconomic class, furthering the discrimination of other identity groups. And so I think it's important for um, conservation groups to be just aware of their general um, natural desire or gravity towards uh, women, socioeconomic class, and uh, indigenous, and understand that there is a need to focus on other identity groups as well. There's a lack of empowering communities. I talked about that earlier. Also, there's there are cases where strategies are just being abandoned without any real clarity as to why they were be aban being abandoned. Uh, again, maybe leadership took a different, uh, decided to go a different direction. Maybe the funding ran out, um, but it is a common challenge um, because for, for individuals, you're talking about their livelihoods, to, ch to change a strategy from, um, from a conservation organization standpoint might just mean, oh, we're no longer doing that. That's it, that's all it really means. But for an individual, it means I'm not gonna be able to feed my child now because you promised that you were gonna go down this strategic route and now you're not. And then also um, not creating both tangible and intangible benchmarks. This goes back to what I talked about earlier, is not about just having uh, numbers and saying we have 50% women and 50% men. Uh, it's also about saying um, we, we surveyed these individuals and they feel safe speaking up and they feel comfortable that they have the tools necessary to talk about the project to their community leaders. So what is next? So one, there are people who are very excited to get this uh, document and we've already started to share as best we can already out, but we need to do a lot more marketing of this document to get it into the hands of practitioners. So we are seeking um, more opportunities to engage wider audiences. Um, likely there will be requests for me to give this presentation um, in more detail and not such a, you know, right now we're talking, this is our first time showing it to the world and to all of you. Um, and I'm kind of trying to highlight the best things I can, but I'm sure um, as time goes on and as we do more of these presentations, I'll be able to knock out exactly the most, um, the key and, and, and most important highlights of the, of, the, of the document. But for now, I would say if you are interested in hearing more about it, if you have questions about the report, 
feel free to reach out to me at leander at lacyconsultingservices.com um, if you're interested in um, maybe providing more opportunities to further the learning around this process. Um, since we've already laid the, the foundational work here, if you're considering that, oh, this would be a great project for my organization, feel free to reach out to me and I'll see what I can do to continue to help bolster this topic um, within the conservation community. So with that, I will stop and see if anyone has any questions because that's a lot of information. Great, thank you so much, Leander. That was really interesting to hear you being able to talk more about the report and just not what's what's in it, but also all the, the great insights that you have uh, from, from completing that work. So uh, for questions, we have um, the ability to have, you, if you'd like to unmute, you can ask that way, or if you'd like to type any questions in the chat, I can read them out loud um, and have Leander answer them that way. We have a lot of people very thankful for your presentation thus far. So thank you. Awesome. Okay. All right. And so if you have a question, feel free to either unmute yourself and speak, or you can type it in the chat box. I can jump in. Um, hi, Leander, Althea Skinner. Uh, hi. Nice to see you. And thanks for the great presentation. Um, Others don't know, but Leander, I, I was one of the people that Leander talked to um, as an input to the document. And so it's really exciting to see it coming together. Um, something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, it's coming up in my work, is the potentially false dividing line between um, sort of the internally focused uh, mm. di diversity, equity, and inclusion work that we do and the externally focused um, social inclusion in conservation work. And what is interesting about this um, way of framing the work is that you're sort of taking the, in, the internally focused operationalization language and applying it to the externally focused conservation project cycle. Um, mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask about that choice because for some of us, it's been, we've been doing work to try to create a line between these two things, which may be indeed false, but just for clarification purposes and operationalization, as we talk about things like social policies and safeguards, which are very clearly about, oper you know, this sort of externally focused, how do you engage stakeholders versus our internal policies. So just curious about that choice. Um, and, and thanks again for the great work. Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question, and that certainly came up. And you'll notice a little bit about that in the report. Um, so there is this uh, dichotomy, like, oh, we're doing internal H. I call it HR Jedi work, um, which is like let's let's all figure out how to work with each other. Um, but what I've learned and what I've seen just through experience and being a part of organizations, that internal work is fantastic, but somehow they uh, it stops there. Like, okay, I know how to work with. Uh, you know, Leander and um, Sarah down the hallway, but I don't know how to bring that into my external work. Like all of a sudden I've forgotten how to do Jedi work when it relates to uh, indigenous groups or to different LGBTQ groups and spaces where um, it's not the norm. That's not what I see every day at my work. And so I find the internal work to really be about um, you, you, you have to do some internal work, right? You need to get the vocabulary right. Uh, you need to know what you're talking about before you engage with these individuals. Um, but that's work you should be doing. That's that's a lifelong journey, right? That, has not, that almost has nothing to do with work. That's really has to do with you and your lifelong journey around this topic of uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And when it talks about externally though, uh, it does take a bit of a different mental model to really help people understand how you apply Jedi into conservation programming. Um, they need, they, we need more examples of what that looks like in the field, because the examples that we're giving for internal work are really about work. It's about workspace uh, Jedi work. And so it's not about working with communities out, um, out there um, versus what we're doing internally. So yeah, it's a great question. One that um, we need to spend more attention and time towards to make sure that there are folks out there who can give us Jedi approaches to conservation and not just to how we work with your coworker down the, down the hallway as you go into the coffee room. Great, thanks I, so much. I have, oh, sorry. <laughs> go ahead. I, I, is, I have, <laughs> go ahead. Ah, Zoom, Zoom, it's just Claudia. Yeah. I it was just um, wanting to comment a little bit of how 
of leave experience in my organization, how those two actually overlap really interestingly. We have one of our teams working with um, an, a, a group in the Netherlands on gender specifically. And one of the key takeaways for our team was that actually how important it is to have this kind of like gender awareness workshop first with the implementing team. Mm-hmm. and. Our- so they can then engage very differently in with the fishing communities that we work in. And, and I think so much of it has to do also with how we define even what our conservation goals are. And so we in particular like work with um, uh, small scale fisheries and our main focus in fisheries with fisheries managers is always commercial species. And just like that create such a huge blind spot for a plethora of species that are used for the sustenance of family. And those are women and children that harvest it. So that in and of itself just started to amplify like, oh, actually, like the, you know, if we do want to have sustainable management for this huge area, just that like shift in lens just opened up the landscape to then we need to you know consider their intertidal coastal zone versus just kind of like more open water so I think um yes there's something to be said about internal internal Jedi we're kind of in the HR space but also like I think really internalizing how that can impact the way we approach the design of of projects and programs is incredibly impactful so Mm -hmm that that dance is really it's really cool so that's a really great question <laughs> yeah no and I, and I just say I really appreciate that and I will say that uh none of us are going to be perfect on this we're all going to make mistakes I make mistakes and I'm supposed to be some sort of Jedi professional um you know just a quick story as you talked about fishers I did work in the Bahamas looking at uh, working with fishers there and we, we did focus groups um looking at marine policy and I remember that in one focus group uh, a young man like ran out of the focus group. Like as soon as we started, I'm like, what is, what's going on? And he comes back a few moments later with uh, an older woman. And I, that was the first time I realized like, oh, there's no women in this focus group. Like, all right, male privilege that happened. Um, but then uh, the fact that she was like considered to be the number one fisher for this entire community and has the most history about fishing in this community, which is like, it blew me away. So I'm still learning and this isn't going to be easy. And it really does talk about it. It takes to sharing these stories about successes and failures for us to be more effective. I think Jill has a question. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. I, I, this was very helpful. Thank you for the presentation. My, my question, I, your presentation, and I think many of us come with the orientation that, you know, uh, a robust kind of diversity, equity, and inclusion framework makes our conservation work more durable um, and and better in the long run. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you've encountered, I think that there are many people within the organization that have a concern that we really are centering people over nature and that there's gonna be trade-offs involved when we start to go down this path. And I'm just wondering if you encounter that in your interviews, how it came up and and how you might frame some responses to that. Yeah, such such a great question. Um, it didn't come up too much in terms of how, how to uh, kind of like justify, I suppose, why Jedi is important. Um, I, and I appreciate what you're saying that people are probably at, at who have come to this right now are probably already in the camp of, we think it's important, we know it's important and how do we do it? Um, you know, I, I don't have a good answer for that because we didn't really talk about that. I can give you a personal opinion about that but I don't know what the full example it would be. Um, you know, we, we are where we are today right, based on current practices. And current practices, um, historic practices have not been inclusive of uh, enough people. And so maybe there's something to say that whatever we're doing right now isn't good enough because we're we're at the climate crisis that we're at today. Um, you know, for all the great work that conservation groups have done, we still haven't achieved what we should have achieved, whatever that looks like. So that might be one way, right? That might be the way I talk about it because that's just, it, mm-hmm. it, it sits with me, but I'm sure everyone else has a different way that they might uh, approach that topic. Thanks. Mm-hmm. And we have a few, uh, we have a question in the chat um, as well. What's the difference between diversity and inclusion? Mm, yeah, um, you know, it's a really good, that's a, that's kind of getting back to the example. I'll just give it again to kind of really make sure I, I drive it home. Um, you know, 
diversity means we could have 50% women on our, on our team, right? Um, but inclusive means that you've created a safe space for them and that they feel welcome and they have the ability to engage and, and they feel empowered in that space. So it isn't just about getting numbers. Diversity is for me is about numbers um, and inclusion is making sure that they have the ability to be successful um, within that space and that they're not just being asked to assimilate Does anyone else have any other questions? We have one other comment in the chat too. Um, in the more collaborative group on holistic conservation, um, they explored some questions of JEDI and conservation projects as well. So stay tuned for that webinar, uh, which is coming up in a few weeks. So that'll be just like this one. <laughs> That's great. And I know a lot of different uh, networks are working on this issue as well. So CCNet, the Conservation Coaches Network, they're also starting to put together a JEDI team to look into this as well. Um, Perfect. I'll go do one last call for questions. Hi, uh, Saras here. Hi. 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 Yes. Oh, I have one really. So it's kind of thinking about the, the flip side and dealing with or supporting people who have privilege. So within like the communities you work in, but also in the internal space as well, who kind of want to do the right thing, but are kind of telling you that it, they're finding it really hard because they find their own privilege very challenging. Mm. Do you have any um, kind of, tips on how to deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I could do a whole workshop on probably just that <laughs> by itself. Um, yeah, you know, it really comes down to getting people comfortable again with failure. Um, you know, acknowledging and dealing with privilege, which we all have, right? Like I had no problem sharing that story that I missed the mark and I didn't know that uh, there was no women in my focus group, right? That, that's, a, that's a male privilege and I totally accept it. And I totally get that. I can live my life not thinking about the fact that there's not a woman included in the focus group. Um, but I could also do something about it. You know, I can also say, you know what, I learned something, I'm gonna do better next time. I'm gonna make sure, I'm gonna commit myself to making sure that there are more diversity within my focus groups. Um, these are just things that we're all learning together collectively as a, as a planet, as human beings. Um, you know, that I think that we need to give ourselves a little bit more um, cushion and um, give ourselves a little bit more um, there's a word I'm looking for to say, hey, it's okay to mess up and it's okay that we have privilege. Privilege is not something that you chose to have. So it's not like you chose this all of a sudden. This is something that was given to you when you were born. You had no choice whatsoever about whether you were, are, were going to or not going to have privilege. So let's give ourselves a little bit of um, slack and say, yeah, I have privilege. Um, I understand that. And I want to work within the confinement of that. Um, also letting people know that privilege is not a bad thing. Privilege allows you to elevate other voices that couldn't have been elevated before um, because you do have privilege. So privilege can be leveraged in a good way and be used for good. Um, you just need to be able to acknowledge that you have it and then be willing to do something with it. Thanks, Leanda, that's very helpful. <laughs> One last call for questions. Okay, well, hearing none, um, thank you so much, Leander, and the rest of your, uh, your team here for putting on this fantastic webinar. We've been recording this, so it'll be put up on our YouTube site, and I will send the link around in a follow-up email to everyone as well with some links to register for all of our upcoming mini webinars for the rest of our collaborative learning initiatives. So keep an eye out for that, and uh, have a great rest of your day, everyone.